Hey there friends, Dave Flight of Scanning Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here. And this is a good good episode. It's gonna uh, it's gonna hit on a lot of points for you today. But before I get going under that, I want to say thank you to all of you who have purchased Missing 411 Washington and made it our best seller yet. The number of people that have already commented that they've made it through the book and said it's fascinating, great stories. I want to say thank you very much. This is going to be front and center on most of our items from now on, the bald eagle. And along with the book, we came out with our hat, Liberty Ben's initials, our logo on the back. You can get it at our website, NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com. Go to the company store. Thanks everyone for doing that. Now, when I talk about missing people, it's hard to talk about missing people without talking about Native Americans. And I've done several cases on Native Americans who have disappeared. I've sat on this case for over two years. And the reason being is I kept waiting for more information to go out, come out, but there never really has been. It already fits the missing 411 profile to a T. It's in an area where we have almost no missing people, which is odd but it couldn't be ignored. And a little bit about Native Americans. <clears throat> right now, the drug cartels are moving into reservations in a big way. And they're targeting females, single females living on a reservation. They try to get up close to them, throw big money at them, and they're getting a foothold in these reservations right now. Mexican drug cartels. So reservations have had a long history of, of issues, not being well managed, um, alcohol abuse, drug abuse. And if these cartels get a, get a foothold in the reservation, it's gonna decimate them. And I feel very sorry that it's happening. Many of you have heard that Harvey Pratt is my best friend. He, he's, the, he's the artist who did the bald eagle on the front. Harvey worked 40 years for the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation and he's a Native American chief and he's worked a lot of crime on reservations in Oklahoma. And he's told me that the law enforcement on these reservations is horrific. He said, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs can't even find their own reports. And sometimes the management on the reservation squelches criminal investigations trying to save family members and friends from prosecution. It's horrible. And he said so. And he said, Dave, they need help. They need task forces to move in there and start cleaning house. So my heart, if you're living on a reservation, my heart's with you. Now this case involves three people, two disappeared. Arnold Archambault, 20 years old, and Ruby Bregeer, 19 years old. Case happened December 12th, 1992 at 7 a.m. right next to Lake Andy, South Dakota on the Yankton Sioux Reservation, 123 miles south of Sioux Falls. Now, this is Arnold and Ruby. They met each other in high school, started dating. Uh, they ended up having a child together. At the time of this incident, the child was 19 months old. So Arnold was driving their car. Ruby was in the middle of the front seat and they had a 17 year old cousin in the right front seat. Now Arnold 
was raised by his grandmother and was employed by the Fort Randall Casino. He had a really good job. And he was able to support he and Ruby. Now the road that morning was slightly icy, had a light rain. Arnold was driving down the road, lost control of the car, went off the side into a deep ditch and overturned the vehicle. This is, the, this is a picture of the vehicle. If you look at the, the top of the car, you can see that it rolled over. In general, this car is not in bad condition for being rolled over. It was a big car. It looks like the driver's door came off. But the car was not in bad shape. And because they were driving a big car, it might have been what saved their lives at the time. Now, Arnold and Ruby, as the car stopped in this ditch that had water in it, Arnold and Ruby get out of the car, up the uh, driver's side. The cousin's still in the car, trapped, couldn't get out. And she's yelling at him, hey, help me get out, help me get out. And she said they got out, and then they just disappeared. She originally said to police that she saw them walking down the road a ways and then got into another car and saw them leave. That changed. They proved that she couldn't have seen that while she was trapped in the car. And she was trapped in the car until somebody else came along, saw the accident, and then helped her get out. And then law enforcement arrived. The cousin explains what happened. And they, they had frozen bodies of water in the area. South Dakota, December, it's really cold. And they, law enforcement felt that those two probably walked away. They thought maybe they were dazed, hurt, fell into a body of water through the ice and drowned and are dead. So they searched for, for a long time. They contacted family and friends, told them what happened. And the strange thing was, they weren't finding any tracks in the field. They weren't finding any blood marks where maybe they were hurt and dripping blood. There was nothing. So the next day, family and friends in law enforcement decide that they're going to make a big push, even though it was really cold. They're going to make a push out there, and that was the fields. There's nothing out there to see what would happen. Maybe they could find a body. Maybe they could find somebody. So here is Lake Andes, right up through here. The incident happened just east of the lake kind of between Lake Andes and Ravina. Now down here, this is the border between South Dakota and Nebraska. This is the Missouri River. So you get a feeling where this is happening at. And there is nothing out here. But I always want to make people atten pay attention. This happened right next to the big lake. And the accident scene happened in a ditch filled with water. Just saying, laying the facts out there for you folks. Well, after that second day of searching, Bureau of Indian Affairs, FBI, local county sheriff are all taking a part in the investigation. As Harvey Pratt once told me, he said, Dave, I was with an Indian, Bureau of Indian Affairs a senior officer, meaning somebody way up in their department, and they couldn't even find the reports that they had submitted months earlier. They couldn't get them back. That's, that's unbelievable. <laughs> how could you not get your own reports? But he said that's how much in chaos that department is. And sadly, the Bureau of Indian Affairs never listed Arnold and Ruby as missing. Because after that second day, they couldn't find them. 
One of the local sheriffs, a detective, took an interest in the case and continued to come back to that scene and search it time after time. Because in his heart, he thought, man, the body's got to be here somewhere. We just got to be missing it. So, one last time, I want to tell you that investigating a lot of fatal accidents, the car is not damaged very much for overturning in a ditch. I mean, I looked at it, and to me, you know, I'm guessing the windshield is busted up, but I can't even see the windshield is that, that badly destroyed. So, for what that's worth. But there's some serious reminders about this case that I want everyone to keep in their mind. When I wrote the book, Missing 411, A Silvery Coincidence, it involved a series of young people, 17 to 30, 35, who had disappeared, who had been drinking, who had point of separation, who had unaccounted for time, and then inexplicably wound up in a body of water deceased. That's essentially missing 411 a sobering coincidence. Nobody ever sees the people go in the body of water, ever. Well, in this case, you have three people, 17 to 20, each had been drinking, two disappear. Cousin sees nothing, point of separation. So over the course of the next three months, after December 12, 1992, family, friends, law enforcement, search, look, talk, are absolutely baffled. Arnold was raised by his grandmother, and she stated that this behavior of him is so totally out of character it makes no sense. He was committed to his child, and he was committed to Ruby. And them just taking off like that made no sense to anybody. Now, during that three months, some people had come forward and stated that they had seen Arnold and Ruby by themselves or with other people, but never saw those two together in different communities in the area. But they had claimed that they were positive that they had seen the two. They were positive. Remember that. They said that. As I have also stated on every missing person's case, observations like that are totally normal. You get them all the time. You put zero credence in it. You follow up and you look, but you don't put any credence in it. Unless it's a family member who walked up to him and talked to him, I'd take the incident report or supplemental report, but I it means nothing to me really, because thousands of times I've I've read this and it turns out not to be true. Just telling you facts. So three months later, this incident happened on December twelfth, March tenth. 1993, at 7 a.m., at the same time as the accident, a man is driving down the same highway, almost at the exact same spot, and is looking as he's driving and he sees off the side of the road in the ditch a body floating in water. You can't believe it. He pulls over, stops, looks. Yeah, it looks like a body. Gets back in his car, didn't have a cell phone. Had to drive into town. Calls the sheriff, calls Bureau of Indian Affairs. They start responding. 20 minutes later, they get there. They pull the body from the water. Looks like a female. But it's pretty badly decomposed. They pull the body from the ditch 20 feet, 20 feet 
from where the original accident occurred for Ruby and Arnold. Now they make a note when they pull the body out that person wasn't wearing glasses, person wasn't wearing shoes. The ice had started to break up there in South Dakota recently, but it was still freezing cold in the water. The body seemed to have been there for quite a while. Police call for the coroner. Coroner comes out, takes custody of the body, takes it back for autopsy. The police in the area are smart. They know the only two people missing around here is Ruby and Arnold. So they get more police out to the scene and they think, well, stranger things have happened. Maybe his body's out here somewhere. So they do another search probably the 20th search they've done in the area. Come up with nothing. They drained that ditch that the body was in trying to look for more evidence. Didn't find, the, find anything. So late that day, they load up. Everyone goes back to their departments and the body goes for autopsy. The next day is March 11th. March 11th, 8 a.m. Person driving down the same highway in the same area and they look off to the side of the road and they see another body. Call the police, call a coroner, call the sheriff. This body is 20 feet from the body that was recovered the day before. This time it's a male decomposure to the body isn't as great as it was to the first body. Police privately are saying this has got to be Ruby and Arnold. They sent it for autopsy. Coroner states at autopsy that Ruby was the more decomposed body. And it appeared to the relatives that it, it was so blatantly obvious that she had to have died before Arnold because the decomposure was so more, much more advanced. Coroner stated that neither had injuries from the accident. They had no injuries to their body. Now the coroner made a statement that shook up South Dakota. And it's one of the very, very rare times you ever see a coroner make a statement like this to the public. He stated that both bodies to him appear to have died on or about December 12th, 1992. Whoa, whoa. Whoa. Police, Sheriff, Bureau of Indian Affairs have a big press conference. And the families. And they say, those bodies were not in those ditches between December 12th and March 10th. They were not there. Police drive that road every day. People drive that road every day. Look into the ditch every day. We've searched the ditches, we've drained the ditches. No, those bodies weren't there. Hmm. Okay. And then the police say they must have died someplace else and were brought back to that scene. But the police have no evidence of any criminality. Meaning there was no violence to the body. Now, one thing they didn't say, the coroner didn't say, is what the blood alcohol levels were in these bodies. And why is that important, Dave? Well, because the cousin stated, and other people had justified, that Ruby and Arnold had been drinking alcohol up to very close before the accident happened. Now, when you die, whatever blood alcohol was in your system, 
that blood alcohol level will stay the same forever when you go in and you take a chemical analysis of the body. As you're alive, the blood alcohol level can, can, continues to come down as your body wears it out. But when you're dead, it stays there. So if they died close to 7, 8 o'clock in the morning on December 12th, their blood alcohol level would be in the body and it would be found. But if they died on December 12th, 12 hours after the accident, there would be no blood alcohol in the body. The coroner never stated if there was a blood alcohol level in the body. So that's one thing that interests me. It's fascinating to me that Ruby didn't have shoes on because they disappeared in the middle of winter. Nobody would walk around without shoes. Her shoes were never found. Now I know that I have a group of super smart people here and I'm going to lay this on you and I want you to think very hard about it. Let's say option one, Ruby and Arnold get out of the car before the cousin because Arnold doesn't want to get caught drunk driving. He runs down the road with Ruby, gets a friend to take him home. And for some reason or another in the car on the way there, they both die for some reason. I have no idea because I can't think of a scenario that fits, but they both die. So the person giving them a ride throws them in their backyard where the bodies will freeze and will stay frozen all winter. And then this person decides to get rid of the bodies before they thaw and they throw them on the side of the road near the accident scene March 10th and March 11th. Okay. Do you buy that? Here's why that would be pure stupidity. First of all, I could buy into throwing both bodies in the ditch at the same time on March 10th. That makes sense to me. Why? Well, it's a pretty busy highway and it could be argued maybe they were missed during the 20 searches that were done in that area. Problem. Ruby's found on March 10th. Big search after her body's found. They don't find anything. The next day, Arnold's found. His body wasn't there the day before, and now suddenly it's there. This is where the, the accident happened and the bodies were found. All of this out here is wide open nothingness. There's dirt roads off here. You drive off a dirt road, throw a body in a field, and no one would ever know. So you're a criminal. Think like you're a criminal. So you drop Ruby's body next to the accident scene on March 10th. And then you come back March 11th when that scene, that accident scene, is again front and center in the newspaper on everybody's mind everyone who's driving by is looking you're going to stop your car on the side of the road and dump the body out there again and possibly be seen i mean there's a lot of stupid criminals but i don't even think there's that many that stupid again why not go down the highway go off a dirt road throw the body off the side, you're done. I'm saying this because I'm hoping that I'm making the point to you how ridiculous this sounds. And that unless something super unusual is happening, I don't see this being a case where somebody dumps the bodies on the side of the road. When you dump a body, you throw a body, it gets bruised. Things happen. There were new bruises on the body. The bodies were placed in a body of 
water. The police later stated there are no suspects, but they're confused by the case. There was no violence to the bodies. And remember what the coroner said. He believes they died on December 12th. My question comes back again to when the accident happened, what did the cousin really see in that car? Is there any flashes of light? Is it possible she lost consciousness? Why did the car run off the road? Did something happen that intervened that caused Arnold to lose consciousness? Was Arnold even in the driver's seat? See where I'm going with this? It's like an X-Files case. So why is this related to missing 411 a sobering coincidence? Point of separation. When Arnold and Ruby get out of the car, cousin doesn't see him again. A water-filled ditch. The car was in a water-filled ditch. The ditch was later emptied, nothing was in it. The biggest lake in the area is right next to where this happened. The trio had been drinking. There's a massive amount of unaccounted for time. And then they come back to that loving declaration, they died of exposure. Another thing I'd like to have seen from the corner that I'd like to know for myself is if you went back in time and you interviewed the witnesses who had contact with Ruby and Arnold and the cousin over the previous 12 hours, I want to know what they had to eat. And then I want to know what the contents of that stomach were. Parallel dimensions, parallel dimensions. There's a lot of theories about this, that if you go from one dimension to another, do you continue to age or do you stay in that age bracket while you're in that dimension? Do you go backwards in time? There's a lot of questions about this. And when this happened to Ruby and Arnold, it made me think about that. Because again, I don't believe that somebody else had these bodies. Somebody meaning like a friend, a relative, somebody in the area. I just, I don't see that. There was no sign of a sexual assault. Arnold was wearing all of his clothes, shoes. Ruby wasn't. It's a very, very understandable case if you've read my book. If you didn't read the book, your mind is always going to keep going back to trying to come up with the rational answer to what really happened here. But I appreciate you hanging in there and thinking as I am out loud about what happened. People say, well, you don't talk about disappearances on reservations very often. Well, I do. I have talked about them in the past. And I personally know for a fact that most of the missing people on reservations are related to drug, alcohol, and crime. And again, you could argue this was related to alcohol. But I think there was much more to this story than law enforcement or the relatives would ever give them a nod to. I feel very sorry for the Archambos and the Brugiers. They lost a couple nice kids. And Ruby's daughter would be 28. No, she should be 32 years old right now. So if you happen to see this, know that it's, we did this in the most respectable terms. I don't know what happened to your mom, 
something very unusual did. Please share this on your social media site and uh, let me know if you're still subscribed or you're being unsubscribed. I'd like to know that. And uh, check out our website, NA, like North America, BigfootSearch.com. Thanks for being here, folks. Polite us out.